Um, so I'm going to go quickly and use them to punctuate what I'm saying. And I know you're all very image literate, so I hope this will be useful. I want to focus the talk on the last idea, which is the question about how we could respond in the Bay. And since I'm new to the Bay, I've only lived here for a year, just moved here from Virginia, um, I may be wrong. But I'm tracking other speakers and trying to make sure that this makes sense and uh, feel better, actually, after what they said than before I heard their talk. So we'll see. Um, so I'm going to go quickly through some of the examples of what people are already doing in other parts of the world. Because I think there's a lot for us to learn. And I can say from personal experience, having been a member of the National Climate Technical Assessment Team that was convened by the um, National Research Council, we do not know enough about what's happening in the rest of the world. Because I was the only person in the room who had been to these projects around the world. So we have a lot to learn. And I think it's a huge opportunity. So first I want to address something that Dilip just talked about, which is a nice, uh, nice connection. In London, there's a lot of work being done in, in UK in general around the Thames River. But one of the things they're doing is articulating um, what they call adaptation pathways or decision pathways, which is similar to what Dilip was just talking about, in that they are talking about if sea level rises to different levels, let's not debate which one it's going to be, but let's lay them all out. Then here are the things we would do um, in the Thames River to protect central London. And they have a whole bunch of different things, each of which is represented by one of these boxes. And they're saying, here are the different pathways we could take to get to different sea level adaptation. Um, so what I like about this is that it's very clear about how they think we could get to different places. And they could add a net present value and a cost analysis to this. But this is what they use to manage public discussion about how to get to things. And what I would call this is the just-in-time approach, which I think is something like what Dylan was talking about. You build in some capacity, and then you take a just-in-time approach. But in the UK, they don't have a funding mechanism. So their funding mechanism would be public taxes, basically. And what's going to happen, I'm afraid, is that if we all take a just-in-time approach globally, because it saves money and saves, it makes more sense than net present value analysis. When countries go to borrow to do all this work, everyone will be monitoring the same thing about sea level rise, and everyone will be trying to get expensive loans. Because when everyone wants money at the same time, it costs more. So that's what I worry about. On the Dutch side, uh, they actually have a, uh, an, an inscription over their stock exchange that says the costs come before the benefits. And they're investing today for 30, 40 years of adaptation. Because costs are low, interest rates are low right now. So they're saying, let's do the opposite. Let's borrow now while it's cheap, and then we'll be ready. And that's how they've learned the most of pretty much anyone about how to do this. So you can look at it either way. Most of my work has been in New Orleans on this topic. And I have developed a fear of flood walls and levees. Because what they do, this is a, a kind of famous photo now by Mario Tema from Getty Images. Um, what they do is prevent us from seeing the water around us. So if it gets to the point where we're living behind a wall, we're going to start making mistakes at the scale of New Orleans type mistakes. And it's not just New Orleans, it's many places that live behind a wall. Um, living behind levees in Europe, people find the same kinds of problems coming up that they don't, they believe that they're safer than they actually are. And instead of thinking of themselves as having a lifestyle that's adapted to flooding, they think of themselves as fully protected, when actually in floods they're not. The other piece of this problem in the Bay Area, which Roger mentioned, is that we've had a long history here of focusing on habitat and making huge strides to reestablish habitat in the Bay. There's a big train wreck coming, because all that habitat, if it gets flooded, all that work is gone and we'll be converting these intertidal areas to eelgrass beds, which is what's shown here in this slide. Subtidal meadows may become what we have a lot of and not intertidal uh, wetlands. So there are a lot of trade-offs coming, and um, I see a train wreck coming about some of the habitat issues, especially if we follow the Europeans, because they have not been successful on biodiversity um, support at the same time they do flood protection. They don't have lessons to teach us about that except what not to do. So that's an area where we really need to think about how we're going to innovate. I'm going to show very quickly what, I, what was in my title about um, some of these different strategies. This is a super dike that was built in Osaka in Japan. It was built to be um, high enough. This is the previous dike structure. 
built to be wide enough, it didn't actually change the height. They changed the width of the super dike, um, uh, tripled it, and then they extended everyone's property rights up and built on top of it. So instead of living behind an enormous levee, they decided to live on top of the levee and be able to see the river and have parks on top of the river and uh, vegetate it and put infrastructure in it and so on, which you can't do with a traditional levee. Um, so they changed their strategy for the levee during a time when interest rates were low and their economy was in the tank in the 1990s. So they used that time to build these uh, super dikes. In the city of Hamburg in Germany, over the last um, 15 years, they've taken an area that was warehouses, um, that was outside of the main levee of the city, which is built mostly up on a bluff. And these warehouses are not necessary for the port anymore because of all the containerization. So they took that warehouse district and made it into housing, and they hardened the entire uh, first floor, which you know normally in urban design we would recommend against, not having anything on the first floor of a building. But there's a beautiful view to the other side, so it works in this setting. Um, and they prepared for the potential flood by um, having an emergency walkway level, which I'll show in just a second. Here's the, um, the level of the harbor and uh, the level of the buildings. And down here, watch what happens when you go from low tide to high tide to storm tide. And they get these storm tides pretty much every year now, at least once a year. Um, and that's why they've hardened that first floor of the building. What they get out of it is they still have circulation because they have basically a second floor emergency circulation system. They have waterproof parking garages like probably only the Germans can build. <laughs> Picture an American waterproof parking garage. Uh, and people park their cars in there when they get a report that the storm is coming, which they usually know sometime in advance. Uh, unless you go to Malaga and forget that your car is out there, your car is in good shape. And then people can actually play in the flood and know that it's something that's uh, reasonably under control. So I think that relates to what Roger was talking about, about lifestyle changes. If we engage with the water and design our adaptation so that we can engage with the water, we will be smarter and more resourceful at how to live <coughs> with the water, as opposed to putting up levees around, all around the bay that would prevent us from seeing it and being aware of what's happening. Uh, Rotterdam is on Water Plan 2.0. That's the two over here. Uh, I just worked on the first American water plan that I know of for the city of New Orleans, their new water management strategy. Every city needs a water plan. This is important business for all of us um, and something that citizens should really care about. What they've talked about in Rotterdam is that there are really four directions of water uh, flow that have to do with sea level rise and climate change in general. One is that we expect to see more intense rain. Roger talked about that and uh, Dillip also in terms of backwatering. Um, we expect to see intense rain upriver that may be far away. In Europe, it may be some other country. Um, where that intensity kind of happens and the flood comes to them uh, in their countries. We expect to see sea level rise and we expect to see groundwater rise as a result of sea level rise. So there are really four directions of water that we have to think about together. They, to address some of the coastal issues, um, Dillip talked about how much sand they're placing. They're beginning to do what they call mega nourishment. And they think of it as mimicking nature. It's just mimicking glaciers instead of mimicking little bits of sand that might come down rivers in normal floods. So that's a bolder approach to mimic the glaciers, um, but that's what they're doing. This took uh, 28 million cubic yards of sand, which just completed in 2011. They use a side caster for their uh, dredge placement, which we often can't use, at least on the east coast of the US, the Army Corps won't let us. It's not precise enough. Well, hello, maybe it doesn't need to be that precise <laughs> given what we're facing. Um, that sand is already on the move. They've been able to show their monitoring it weekly with laser-based survey tools and monitoring currents and so on. Um, and this nose of that shape is already moving towards the shoreline. And this is what it looked like just a few months after it, after it opened. Here's that nose has grown. Uh, there's a little pond here for dewatering that sand. Um, it's been a complicated project, but one that they believe um, actually will be a lot cheaper. So it caught, if this works, if this sand they placed here moves along the shoreline and nourishes a length of shoreline that's between seven and 10 miles, then it will have cost 25% of what a typical nourishment program for that length of shoreline would have cost. 25%. The Dutch are cheap. I don't want to offend anyone who's Dutch in the room, but it's about the money, just like we are. 
And that's why they're doing this, because it's about the money. And they think this is less expensive to let the waves do the work than it is to place it with bulldozers and take the energy to move all of the sand up to the beach um, with pipes. 